people didn't know what it was. Okay, it, it was only because of that that people didn't try to approximate interference as Gaussian while trying to find the coverage and rate. So trying to approximate interference as Gaussian and trying uh, finding the error probability is not an exactly right approach. Okay. So we thought of using another metric called as error vector magnitude. Okay. So the reason is you can try and express error vector magnitude in terms of probability of coverage itself. We have already derived the expression for probability of coverage. So we may be able to use and find error vector magnitude. Next slide, slide number 21. Okay, so what is the definition of EVM? So let's have a simple system model. Y of i equals X of i into H plus N of i. Okay, next. The definition of EVM is expectation of square root of summation of the errors. So you equalize Y of i, Y of i by H minus X of i the whole square divided by N. So H is going to be constant for N symbols, okay? And uh, this root mean square, okay? So your EVM is going to be essentially expectation of square root of one by SNR, if you do the math for this, okay? Next slide, literature. So one of the earliest works in this field was by Shafiq, trying to relate EVM, BR, and SNR. And then by Mahmoud, uh, where uh, the relation between EVM to SNR was found for non-data guided receivers. And in 2016, there was a paper by Thomas where they derived EVM for CMO channels, which have MRC. But all these folks do not consider interference in top -out. So they are for the plain vanilla model of Y is equal to XH plus N. So there's no interference considered. Okay. So in, in our work, we are trying to consider interference. Okay, so before even going into Poisson point process, we wanted to do for a regular external network, okay? So we consider L interference here, okay? Slide number 23. And here the de definition of EVM is going to be expectation of square root of one by SIR, okay? So you had the square root of one by SNR there. Here I ignore noise. So here the definition of EVM will be expectation of square root of one by SIR, okay? Next slide, slide number 24. So SIR is going to be a signal power in the numerator divided by the total interference power in the denominator, okay? Next. So you can write your EVM as expectation of square root of one by SIR, right? So you can write it as basically expectation of square root of interference power by signal power. So the total interference power is GI, signal power is G, okay? Next slide, slide number 25, okay? So now let's again assume the Couple of shadow fading. So the PDF of G is given here, as you already seen. Okay. The PDF of GA, so the PDF of total interference for GA is also given here. It is on the same paper by Paris. Okay. And now, if we substitute in the EVM expression and do the math, we will derive the EVM in closed form as given here. Okay. So uh, next, if you see this plot, in slide number 26. The x-axis is number of interferers, the y-axis is the EVM, okay? So for different values of mu, kappa, and m, we have plotted the EVM expression, okay? And it also matches the simulation. The impact of shadowing is more when LOS is strong. So when your kappa value is high, okay? The impact of shadowing, that means when m is very low. When m is very low, it means the shadowing is very high. So that impact is more when your line of sight is strong. Okay. That is the inference from this plot. Slide number 27. So from whatever we derive for kappa mu shadow fading, right? The expression we can derive for different fading models. Lysian fading, and again it has a plot. Slide number 28. We can derive for Nakagami fading. And next, by using this lemma, okay, we can also derive for no fading. So next, when you allow m hat and m i hat to tend to infinity, okay, and use a lemma given in this slide, you will see that when there's no fading, EVM basically approaches the square root of number of interferers. So it's also very intuitively clear because EVM is basically expectation of square root of interference for the signal power, okay. So I'm saying that there's no fading, so remove the expectation. So it's basically EVM equals square root of total interference power by signal power 
let's assume all the interferers have equal power okay and i told there are l interferers right so it's going to be basically square root of l by 1 which is square root of l so that's the intuitive understanding but we also derived it more rigorously uh, using the map okay so next slide slide number 29 so if you want to see a plot for this right so the x axis is uh, nakagami of desired signal m hat the y axis is evm for the interference we will take mi hat as phi the nakagami parameter as phi okay so phi itself is quite reasonably large so if you see as m hat increases right your evm basically goes towards the square root of number of interferers so we have three colors here the blue color is for l equal to 9 9 interferers the red color is for l equal to 4 4 interferers and l equal to 1 is the black color so as the number of interferers increase so as uh, sorry as m hat increases okay you can see the evm approaching the square root of number of interferers so the black curve approaches 1 the red curve approaches 2 and the blue curve approaches 3 okay so this is just to show what are we derived in the last line okay next slide number 13 So what we have seen is for the regular hexagonal model. Now in this one slide we will see for the PPP model. Okay. So EVM is expectation of square root of one by S A R. Okay. Now for any positive random variable, okay, you can write the expectation of x as integral probability of capital X greater than some small x dx. Okay. So basically integral of C C D F. That will be equal to expectation for a positive random variable. So here we can write the expectation of square root of one by S A R as integral of probability of one by square root of S A R greater than t d t. Okay. So if we rearrange this, you can write E V M as integral of one minus coverage. Okay. Of the parameter one by t square d t. Okay. So we know already the expression for coverage. We can put it here and we can derive the E V M value numerically. Okay. So we told you why it was difficult to uh, derive probability of error, but it's easy to express EVM in terms of coverage. Okay. Okay. Slide number thirty-one. EVM for correlated interference. Now, so in what are we are considered till now? We are considered the interference to be independent of each other, right? So, but the interference can also be correlated. For example, here we have one direct channel H, and a channel between the U E and base station one is H one. The channel between U E and base station L, which is the interferer L, is H L. These channels, right, H one to H L, they can be correlated. Okay. So uh, we are going to consider E V M for this for a correlated system. Slide number thirty three. So this is a system model. Next, and the E V M definition as usual. So your E V M is going to be expectation of square root of one by S A R. There is no change in that. Next slide, slide number thirty four. The S A R definition same as before. I need the EVM definition. So expectation of square root of one by S A R. Your interference goes power goes to the top. So square root of y by x, where x is the desired channel power, and y is the total interference power, G I. Okay. Next slide, slide number thirty-five. So here also we assume the fading channels to experience Kappa mu shaded fading. Okay, because it generalizes all the fading models. So F G of x remains the same. There's no change in that. Next, but the F G I of Y, the total interference power, if you have correlated Kappa mu shaded fading interference, that is different now when compared to what we saw before. Okay. So the expression for this is given in this paper by Professor Mara Bhatnagar of IIT Delhi. Okay. So here, lambda I is basically the eigen values of matrix D into C. Next slide. So D is basically diagonal matrix with values mu i, k i by m i, okay, and C is this correlation matrix, okay. So basically, row one two is a correlation between channel H one and H two, row one l is a correlation between channel H one and H l, and so on, okay. Next, so if you substitute this PDF of F G and F G i and try to find the E V M, you will be able to derive the E V M in closed form as given here, okay. Next slide, slide number thirty-seven. Okay. So when there were, when there was no correlation, okay. So you remember me saying 
in the very first uh, part of this talk, while talking about coverage, I told you that when mu is equal to m, when you change kappa, the coverage doesn't change. It is same for EVM also, when there's no correlation among interference. When mu i equals m i, if you change kappa i, the EVM won't change, okay? And similarly, when there's no correlation, when m i is greater than mu i, okay? If you increase kappa i, then your EVM will increase. Okay, so m i, let's assume that m i is equal to infinity, which means there's no shadowing at all, okay? mu i equal to 1, kappa i equal to 4. So this is your ICM fading model, where the, uh, the line of sight in the interference is strong. Okay, so your kappa i equals to 4 and mu i equals to 1. And another case is a red curve, where mu i equals to 1, kappa i equals to 0. So your line of sight in the interference is weak. Okay, so the EVM will be high for kappa i equal to 4, because it is basically, you know, your the line of sight in the interference is strong, so your error is going to be more. Okay, so your EVM will be high when kappa i equals to 4, okay, which means uh, Lyzian line of sight of factor 4, okay. Now, what I told before was when mu i equals to i, there's no impact of change in kappa i, right? So that is true only when there's no correlation. But the moment you bring correlation, right, that is no longer true. So in this, figure, figure slide number 39, the x-axis is the correlation row, the y-axis is the error vector magnitude, okay? So, when rho is equal to 0, for both kappa i equal to 1 and kappa i equal to 5, it's the blue and red curve, the values are same. But the moment you have a non-zero correlation, okay, the, they are no longer same. So, there's a divergence in both these figures. Okay? So, it's a very interesting thing that what is the impact of correlation, okay? Next slide, slide number 40. When mi is greater than mu i, okay? So again, the impact of kappa i depends on rho. So when mi is greater than mu i, okay? When there's no correlation, as we saw before, with increase in kappa i, your EVM will increase. But that is true when there's no correlation. When there's more correlation, it's no longer true. With increase in kappa i, your EVM actually decreases. Okay? It's also an interesting observation. Now, we have seen, we have derived the EVM in terms of, uh, you know, kappa mu shadow fading. But I would like to actually try to understand this much more. I would like to see what happens to EVM, right? So what happens to the error in presence of correlation when compared to the value of EVM when there's no correlation? So whether because of correlation, your EVM decreases or increases. So that's what I try, want to find analytically, okay? So for that, I'm going to use the Nakagami fading. So it's because much more easy to do Nakagami fading with okay, the mathematical analysis, okay? So this will be a PDF of total interference power if you have correlated Nakagami fading, okay? And if you substitute this, this is the EVM that we will derive, okay? If there's Nakagami fading in both the desired channel and the interfering channel, okay? And if the interference are all correlated, then the EVM is given uh, in this slide. Okay. Next, slide number 42. Now I want to actually prove to you that because of correlation among interferers, EVM decreases, which means the correlation among interferers is actually a good thing for us. That's what I want to prove. Let's see how, uh, the reason why I'm going to do this is, though it has some slightly involved math, the reason I'm doing that is maybe if you find a similar thing in your research, right? That may be helpful for you. That's the reason I'm doing this. So the EVM due to uncorrelated thing is basically expectation of square root of uncorrelated interference by signal power. The EVM due to correlated thing is expectation of square root of correlated interference by signal power. Next. So the expectation will preserve the inequalities. Next. The objective for me is to prove that the EVM due to correlated case is less than or equal to the EVM due to uncorrelated case. That's the objective I want to prove. Next slide, slide number 43. Okay. So total interference power 
in the uncorrelated case, which means the independent case, is summation of GJ. Okay, I told you that all the channels experience Nakagami fading, so the channel powers are gamma distributed. Okay, summation of GJ where GJ is gamma distributed. Next, you can write this as summation of theta j into capital GJ. Okay, where GJ is of parameter mi comma one. And theta j is basically equal to one by m i. Okay. Next. Similarly, the unco the correlated case, okay, is going to be summation of g j. So now the g j is are correlated, and gamma distributed of parameters m i comma one by m i. This you can write as summation of lambda j into capital g j. The capital g j is same as before. And these lambda j s are the eigen values of d c. So you remember what is the d and c, right? So we have a similar DC matrix here also for Nakagami fading. Slide number forty-seven. Okay. So C is a correlation matrix as we saw before. D is this diagonal matrix which has all these theta values. So if we just go back to slide number forty-six, you can see this uh, theta values here, right? I U equal to summation of theta J into capital G J. So that will be the in the diagonal uh, elements of D matrix. Okay. Next. Now I am going to talk about majorization. So this is what I told, right? So if at all you know, if you might find these things useful in your research, maybe it's not immediately obvious to you, or you might feel why it is necessary. Why I am doing all this math? I am doing this because if you find it useful in your research, then it will be good for you, right? So that is the reason. So the lambda j's are eigen values of matrix D into C. Okay, the theta j's are eigen values of matrix D dot C. So if you take a dot product of D into C, okay, sorry, not a dot product. I mean element by element product of D into C, okay. Then D into C will be basically the D matrix itself because all the other elements are zero, okay. So if you have a diagonal matrix, the eigen values are going to be the diagonal elements. Yeah, nila ganon na may order. D dot C means like the point by point multiplication. Yeah, yeah. Element by element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So D dot C is going to be the D matrix itself because all the other elements are zero, right? The off diagonal elements are zero. So for the diagonal matrix, the eigen values are going to be the diagonal elements itself. So theta j's are going to be the eigen values, correct? Okay? So in majorization, so I'm just going to call it as lambda majorizes theta, okay? If and only if summations of lambda j, okay? So I have k values because it's a So I have L values because I'm considering L interference. Okay, so it's a basically a L cross L matrix. So I have L values. If you take any k from one to L minus one, okay, the summation of lambda j's will be always greater than summation of theta j's. So let's assume that lambdas are you know ordered in a descending order and theta is also ordered in a descending order. Okay, summation of lambda j's will be greater than or equal to summation of theta j's. And for k equal to capital L. Both the summations will be equal. Summation of lambda j will be also be equal to summation of theta j. Okay. Next slide, slide number forty-eight. Okay. So if lambda majorizes theta, okay, it means that summation of lambda j into g j is greater than or equal to summation of theta j into g j. Okay. And because these are random variables, right? So we can't just directly say greater than or equal to. We say it's greater than or equal to in the convex order. Okay. So you remember what the summation of lambda j into g j was? If you if we go back to slide number forty six, summation of lambda j into g j was I C, which means the total interference power due to correlation. Summation of theta j into g j was I U, which is the total interference power due to uh, uncorrelated case. Okay. So back to slide number forty eight. So the total interference power due to correlation is greater than or equal to total interference power due to uncorrelated case. Okay. Next, this is a theorem from this paper by Sumon Kumar. Okay. If x is greater than y in the convex order, okay, and if f is a concave function, then expectation of f of x will be less than or equal to expectation of f of y. Okay. So this is a theorem. This is a definition of theorem. Okay. Now. The square root function is a concave function. Okay, so 
the total interference power due to correlation being greater than a total interference power due to uncorrelated case okay. using this theorem it will mean that expectation of square root of ic by s will be less than or equal to expectation of square root of iu by s okay so the evm due to correlation is less than or equal to evm due to uncorrelated case so you can see the same thing similar thing for kappa mu shaft fading also if you do a sim uh, if you plot the expression that we have given and seen but giving a proof like this may not be easy there okay so just for sake of proof we have taken a much simpler distribution like nakagami fading okay and we are able to see in a very analytical proof why evm due to correlation among interference decreases okay so if the interference are correlated right it's a good thing for us okay next slide slide number 49 okay so we can allow row to tend to zero which means you can get the complete un like uncorrelated case we will get back the old evm that we had for nakagami you can also allow row to tend to one which means completely correlated case okay and uh, if we use slide number 50 okay so like what we did in uncorrelated case right we can allow mi to tend to infinity next we can allow both m and mi also to tend to infinity so if we allow both m and mi to tend to infinity then we will see that our evm is basically square root of number of interference so whatever we saw before okay slide number 51 the x axis is the correlation here the y axis is the error vector magnitude okay so uh, the different plots are for L equal to number of interference equal to two, number of interference equal to five. Okay, what we will see is with increase in number of interference, the impact of correlation increases. So you compare this L equal to five red line, okay, with the blue line which has boxes L equal to two, m equal to one, m i equal to one. So the blue line almost seems like a straight line, right? But whereas the red line, you can see the very uh, nice slope. Okay, so it means. With increase in number of interference, with increase in number of L, the impact of correlation is more profound. Okay. Next slide, slide number fifty-two. So what we were able to see was, or analyze was, uh, only with correlation among interference. We did not consider correlation between the interfering channels and the desired channel. Okay, because it is analytically tough to do it. Okay. So we, but we just thought we will simulate and see how it is. If the interfering channels and the desired channels are correlated, the EVM decreases further. So we already know that you know if the interfering channels are alone correlated, the EVM will be lesser than the EVM in the independent case. This is much more stronger. If your interfering channels and the desired channels, if they are also correlated, then the EVM reduces even further. Okay, but there is no analytical proof for this. It is just a simulation-based study. Okay, so. Uh, we are essentially in the middle of uh, the talk okay so i think we can have a 5 minutes break we can reassemble at 10:15 and we can continue from here okay is it fine nilagan ah yeah fine sudarshan yes yeah, sure okay thank you okay. we we'll just hold it on for 5 minutes yeah yeah
Uh, shall we resume, Mayor Anand? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So next, let us look at about EVM for multi-planetary systems, right? So we have seen for uh, so far for CISO cases. Next, let's look for multi-planetary systems. Slide number fifty-four. Okay. So as I told you already uh, before, while doing a literature survey, I have this paper by uh, Thomas, which analyzed EVM for CMO channels uh, considering MRC maximal ratio combining the receiver, but this is without interference. Okay. Slide number 55. So, if you want to consider multiple input single output case, then the very popular model is the Alamo decoding model. Okay, so the Alamo decoding model is famous because you do not need the channel state information at the transmitter. Okay, but you can get the very same performance like MRC. Okay, or say MRT maximal ratio transmission. Okay, just for a 3 dB loss of array gain, the diversity gain will be preserved. But you may have a 3 dB loss in array again, but you'll get the same performance in diversity. Okay. That is the advantage with Alamo decoding. So in Alamo decoding, to give a brief primer on Alamo decoding, you have two transmit antennas, that's one receive antenna. Okay. The channels are H1 and H2. In the first slot, you will transmit X1 of I, X2 of I. Next slide, slide number 56. In the second slot, from the first antenna, you will transmit minus X2 star of I. And from second antenna, you will transmit X1 star of I. Okay. So this very unique combination is taken. Next slide, slide number 57. Okay. So you have the Alamoti equations for the received symbol. Next, you can write this in terms of the matrix notation. Okay. While well, writing a matrix notation for the second equation for Y of 2i plus 1, you take the conjugate. Okay. So you can write it as y vector of i equals capital H into x vector of i plus n vector of i. Okay. Slide number 58. For this, we can derive the EVM. Okay. So to uh, at the receiver, right, you can do an equalization. Okay. So you can use the pseudo inverse of H. Okay. H star H the whole inverse into H star y vector. Okay. And if you derive the EVM, the EVM will be basically square root of two sigma squared by mod H1 squared plus mod H2 squared. So the two is because of the number of antennas and time slots that you have. Okay. So n number 59. So for this, you can plot the EVM graph. So the x-axis will be noise variance in dB. The y-axis will be the EVM. You can plot it for different fading models. And you can see that the theory and the simulation match as well. Next slide, slide number 16. Here, x-axis is noise variance in dB, the y-axis is the EVM, okay? Again, you're plotting for different fading models, mu equal to one, kappa equal to one, okay? You have m equal to 0 0.51, which is extreme shadowing, and m equal to infinity, which is no shadowing, okay? You plot it for both CISO and MISO cases. So the CISO are the um, red ones, the MISO are the blue ones. Okay, MISO essentially you can see only two antennas here. So you see that the impact of shadowing is lessened when you have more number of antennas. So between the two blue curves, right, there's not much of a gap. Whereas between the two red curves, there's a significant gap. So the impact of shadowing also reduces when you deploy more antennas, okay? So that's what I, yeah, whatever I wanted to tell, I have, in this slide I have told before itself, slide number 61, the effect of shadowing decreases with increasing number of antennas, okay? Okay, slide number 62. So far you have seen kappa mu shadowed fading as some abstract model, you know, that is used to generalize all this Rayleigh and Nakagami rising and all of that. But it also has application in real life. That's what we are going to see, okay? Slide number 63. So let's consider device-to-device -device communication here, okay? Where like two humans are operate having two devices like cell phones, and these two devices are directly communicating with each other. So a typical channel model for this is going to be RICN because you assume that, you know, so device-to-device -device communication, they more likely they'll be in line of sight with each other. Okay. But in 2015, Cotton showed through experiments that the channel fading model can actually be kappa mu shadow fading model. Okay, the reason is because 
the human body itself can cause shadowing so generally we have studied in books right that the buildings that cause shadowing the mountains cause shadowing but here in a device based communication the human body itself can cause shadowing okay. next uh, for this analysis we assume again the poisson point process for um, we are going to assume you know the cellular network coexists with the d2d network and we assume really fitting for the cellular links we assume kappa mu shadow fitting only for the d2d links okay next we assume a fixed distance between tue and re so tue is a transmitter user equipment re is a receiver user equipment we assume a fixed distance of xd between both of them okay. next slide slide number 64 so we want to find the coverage probability of a receiver user equipment which is in the d2d mode okay so the sir is going to be signal power by total interference power it is going to have two interference components so one interference is going to be from the other d2d users the other d2d transmitters that are transmitting in the same frequency time source the other interference is going to be from the cellular base stations the cellular base stations are also transmitting to their users those base stations that are transmitting in the same frequency time resource they are also going to interfere with you okay next so using a similar analysis that we have done earlier we can derive the coverage okay a closed form expression for coverage can be derived next slide number 65 here we have the sar in db and the y axis is the coverage probability okay mu equal to 1 kappa equal to 2 okay but it is not very clear here what is the impact of shadowing okay so m equal to 0.51 is extreme shadowing initially it seems that the shadowing uh, because of shadowing coverage decreases but as the threshold increases the result just gets inverted so we are not very sure from this graph so let's have a look at the other metric average rate or average spectral efficiency okay slide number 66 we are just going to assume the shannon definition okay so as i told you before uh, while discussing uh, evm for ppp for a positive random variable the expectation of x can be the integral of the ccdf itself okay so here also using the definition you can express the rate in terms of coverage okay but there's another way also to do this uh you know the coverage expressions are typically in terms of summations of differentials of laplace transform of interference right and doing a numerical integration over that it's possible but it's too cumbersome so we can use another lemma for this this lemma is from the paper by professor hamdi so if you have expectation of log of 1 plus x by y plus 1 okay you can write it in terms of whatever is given on the right hand side okay so our log of 1 plus snr is also very similar to this right so log of 1 plus s by i plus n not we can divide numerator denominator by n not okay so we'll get a very similar expression and we can use the above lemma and you can directly derive the rate as given here so this rate that is given here is when n not is equal to 0 okay only for the interference limited case you can derive the rate directly as given here so the advantage with this is we know the laplace transform of interference and the laplace transform of signal power already sorry so you can directly deploy them here so there is no not going to be summations of differentials and all those things so you have to just directly deploy put those equations here and do a simple numerical integration so it's very very easy to get the result okay now if you use this and in this graph the impact of shadowing is very clear okay? so because you have shadowing in the d2d channels okay your average spectral efficiency reduces okay so which means that uh, you have shadowing in a channel and you if you design the system that assuming that there is no shadowing okay if you, you design the system for the md equal to infinity case which is there's no shadowing uh, then you might actually end up in a lot of errors because what is the maximum capacity that your channel can you know tolerate is lesser than what you're designing for so you can end up in error so you have to be very careful it might be okay to actually design the system conservatively for md equal to 0.51 which is the extreme shadowing case rather than designing the system for md equal to infinity okay so that is the inference from this graph next slide slide number 69 okay uh, we are jumping into a new topic called interference prediction okay 
slide number 70. So uh, let's assume that there are k symbols in the coherence time. So coherence time is the time when the channel is constant. Okay. So even though the channel is constant, the interference need not be constant for this uh, k symbols, right? So because the interference can be uh, varying between one symbol to another because not all the interference or not all the interference need to be active in all the time slots. Okay? So interference prediction, what basically it says is, okay, suppose I know a few uh, interference values, I1 to IK minus one, okay? Can I predict IK? So not predict IK from I1. Basically, if I know from I1 to IK minus one, so if I have few values, can I predict IK from that? Can I predict the kth interference value from that? So I told you that all the interferes are not active at all the time slots. Okay, so for that we are going to use this Markovian transition matrix. Okay. So this transition matrix will basically determine whether in the next symbol the interfer is going to be active or not. Okay. So x naught plus beta x one is basically you know what is the probability that in the next time slot I am inactive given that I'm inactive in the present time slot, okay? X1 plus beta X0. That is the probability that I will be active in the next time slot given that I'm active in the present time slot. Okay, so this is a transition matrix. X0 is the fraction of silent base stations. X1 is the fraction of uh, active base stations, which is one minus X0. Beta is called as a system memory. So system memory means if beta is very high, okay, then the probability that you will continue in your same state in the next time slot also will be very high. Okay. So we'll see this with an example. Next, we will consider x naught equal to 0.1 and beta equal to 0.9. Okay, then this is your p matrix. Okay, so my fraction of silent base stations is 0.1. My fraction of active base stations is 0.9. My system memory is also 0.9. Okay, because my system memory is 0.9, what I told is I the probability that I will continue in the same state. In the next time slot is high. So the probability that I will continue in the same inactive state is 0.91. The probability that I will continue in the same active state is 0.99. Okay. You may ask me, okay, why is what is the reason? Okay, the probability that I will continue in the active state is higher than the probability that I will continue in the inactive state. Okay, 0 0.99, 0 0.91. What is the reason for that? The reason is comes from the value of x naught and x one. Okay x0 equals 0.1 and x1 equals 0.9, which means the fraction of my active base stations is high. Because of that, the probability that of continuing the active state is also high when compared to the probability of continuing in the inactive state. Okay. Uh, we can also just do a simple calculation of when both these will be equal, when the you know x0 plus beta x1 will be equal to x1 plus beta x0. You can do some fun math with that also. Okay. So this is the setup actually. Next, achievable average rate. Okay. I know the system model. Okay. I'm going to do a prediction. How do I quantify whether my prediction is good or not? That's what I want. So this is a metric that I'm going to follow. Okay. So I'm doing a prediction on the interference power because I told you that the signal power is going to be constant in the coherence time. The interference power keeps changing. I'm going to do a prediction on the interference power. Okay. So what I'm going to use is if the predicted interference IK hat is lesser than IK, okay, the actual interference power, then what will happen? I'm assuming that my interference is going to be lesser. IK hat is less than IK. My prediction is going to say that the interference power is lesser. So I will transmit at a higher rate than what the channel can withhold or withstand, correct? Which means I'm going to be in error. Okay, so for all those cases where I'm going to be in error, okay, which means I mean, uh, IK hat is less than IK, I will give rate equal to zero, okay? When IK hat is greater than IK, I will say the rate is log of one plus signal power by the predicted difference power IK hat. So this is the metric using which I'm going to see whether my prediction is good or not. Okay. Next slide, slide number 71. 
the first thing we do it for this is a vena filter the vena filter is because you know it's the most uh, the linear filter and it's the most obvious thing that comes to our mind okay i want to minimize the mean squared error between the predicted value and the original value so it's a very intuitive thing that comes to our mind okay and the weight matrix is basically going to be r inverse p we know from the uh, vena formula where the correlation matrix r is given here and the p vector is given here so having given this next slide slide number 72 uh, the x axis here is the order of predictor which means uh, ik right so order of predictor 1 means we just use ik minus 1 order of predictor 2 means you use ik minus 1 and ik minus 2 so on and so forth okay the y axis is the average spectral efficiency the top blue line is the original rate so if you had ik log of 1 plus signal power by ik that is the original rate no prediction red line red line is log of 1 plus s by ik minus 1 so if i assume my ik hat equals ik minus 1 that means if i just take the previous value as the interference power then what is the rate so it's nearly 50% of the original rate but you see our vnr rate the black curve at the bottom performs there what's the no prediction okay so the reason for this is the objective of vnr is very different so i told you what our objective is our objective is to you know somehow maximize achievable average rate that is possible but vnr's objective is very different it tries to minimize the mean squared error it doesn't care whether your predicted interference power is greater than the original interference power or less than the original interference power that doesn't matter to vnr right so the vnr objective is very different and our objective is very different so vnr is not something we should use for our problem okay so we will use next slide 73 we will use something called as an asymmetric loss function so in some sense we say the vnr is a symmetric loss function plus a squared error we will use an asymmetric loss function called linux linux means linear exponential okay this was initially used in the us uh, real estate market we are going to use it for our purpose so what this does is when you are under predicting interference okay which you don't want to do because you are you will transmit at a higher rate and your you will end up in error so when you are under predicting interference you penalize it exponentially when you are over predicting interference you penalize it linearly okay so it's an asymmetric loss function now using this we are able to do much better so the blue line with the star okay that is basically uses the linux function the linear exponential function that is much better than a no prediction or a you can say you know the vnr mmsc so it's almost like close to achieving 80% of the original rate okay or 85% of the original rate next slide uh, 74 in the vnr filter which we saw okay we can also do another trick we can bias the weights so our objective is that you know my ik hat should be greater than ik okay so what if i bias my weights in such a way that the sum of the weights is greater than 1 will that help me that's what we wanted to try that actually helped so uh, we were able to get even slighter slightly higher rate than what we were able to get in linux okay so the details of this work is given in this paper if you want to refer okay so uh, uh i am going to talk about last two works now okay and the first one is going to be mixed cell full duplex half duplex noma system slide number 77 so some of the most promising 5g technologies are full duplex and non orthogonal multiple axis right but if you have a complete full duplex noma system one disadvantage will be that there will be increase in interference from uplink users okay because you are having full duplex So though the rate increases directly by 2x, actually the rate might not even increase by 2x. But let's assume the rate increases by 2x. Your coverage is surely going to decrease. Okay. So instead of having a full duplex normal system, a complete full duplex normal system, we can have a mixed full duplex half duplex cell system. Okay. So here the rate will be lesser than what you get in a full duplex normal system, but your coverage will be higher. Okay. Because the interference is going to be slightly reduced. so next slide slide number 78 a brief literature survey of what has been done in this field 
So the first analysis of full duplex and normal together was done in the reference paper one by ZB. Okay. And then full duplex no more was also studied through simulations in reference paper two. Mixed sets and full duplex, half duplex for OMA systems, not for NOMA, for the orthogonal multiplexer systems was studied in paper three. And NOMA was in the presence of interference was also studied in paper number four. Okay. So next slide, slide number 79. The system model is going to be like this. Uh, our locations of base stations are going to have a poison point process as usual. The UEs are not full duplex enabled. The only the base stations are full duplex enabled because you know, the self interference cancellation, the UEs may not be equipped for all those things, or it might consume a huge amount of power in UEs. So let's assume only the base stations are full duplex enabled. The base stations are PPP distributed with intensity lambda V. The UEs are PPP distributed with intensity lambda U. Okay. Rho F denotes a fraction of full duplex base stations. Okay. The intensity of full duplex base stations is lambda V into rho F. So because the whole uh, density of base stations is lambda v. So the fraction of full duplex base stations is rho f into lambda v. Similarly, the fraction of half duplex base stations is rho d into lambda v. Okay. We consider only two NOMA UEs in the same resource. Okay. Uh, it's because if you consider more number of, you can consider more number of UEs, but you're also going to have, you have to pay the penalty in terms of successive interference cancellation, right? So. We'll just assume two normal UEs. Okay. Next slide. So this is a system model. Okay. You have full duplex base station BS1. Okay. It is connected to four UEs, UE1 to UE4. So UE1 and UE2 are in downlink, UE3 and UE4 are in uplink. So UE1 and UE3 are UE2 are in normal downlink and UE3 and UE4 are in normal uplink. Okay. Now let's see what are all the interference this UE1 has to face from. Okay. The UE1 has to face interference from its own, uh, from the uplink UEs from its own cell, which is UE3 and UE4, marked in red color. It has to face downlink interference from a neighboring full duplex base station, BS2, a downlink interference from the neighboring half duplex base station, BS3. It also has to face intercell uplink UE interference. So you have UE3 and UE4 which are connected to full duplex base station BS2 in the same resource. They will also be transmitting. So UE1 has to face all these different kinds of interference. Okay, It has to face intercell downlink interference, intercell uplink interference, and intracell uplink interference. Okay? Now, when you transmit to two symbols in NOMA, right? you have power domain NOMA, where you can transmit to UE1 at a certain power, you can transmit to UE2 at a different power. So you basically the way you differentiate between these two UEs is in terms of the power of transmission. Okay. So X is a symbol that you transmit from the base station. X is equal to root P1X1 plus root P2X2, where X1 is a symbol for UE1, X2 is a symbol for UE2. Okay. P1 is epsilon into PV, and P2 is 1 minus epsilon into PV. Okay, like where the PV is a total power for the base station. Okay. The symbol received at you know UEI will be x into square root of the channel into path loss plus the total interference from others. Okay. So how does decoding happen in NOMA? It happens using successive interference cancellation. Let's assume that UE1 has a better channel condition than UE2. Okay, so what UE1 will do is it will decode x2 and remove x2 and then decode x1. UE2 has a poor channel condition. So UE2 will take X1 itself as an interference. Okay, it won't decode X1 at all. It will just assume X1 has some interference and directly decode X2. Okay. But next slide, slide number 82. But perfect decoding of X2 is not possible at UE1. Okay, so this uh, is captured by a term called beta. So let's see what is going to be the spectral efficiency of UE1 in the full duplex cell log of one plus signal power divided by interference power plus beta into H1 into P2 into R1 power minus R power. This comes because of the fact that you cannot do perfect decoding of X2 at UE1. If you do perfect decoding of X2, beta will be zero. The term itself won't exist. Okay. Next, UE2 decodes X2 directly treating X1 as interference. So what will be the rate at UE2? log of one plus 
signal powered by interference call plus H2 into P1 into R2 power minus alpha. So here it essentially means like saying beta equal to one because I am not doing decoding of X1 at all. I'm just treating it as interference, right? So it's like beta equal to one case, okay? So with these two expressions, we can do the math for this and we can derive the rate. So I'm not going to do all that. I'm directly going to go into the plots, okay? Slide number 83. So you have the uh, threshold in the x-axis and the outage probability in the y-axis. What are the interfer inferences that we can get from this graph? Okay, slide number 84. Instead of using a complete full duplex system, we observe that when a mixed cell system of parameters rho f equal to 0.5 and rho d equal to 0.5 is used, then the outage decreases, which means the coverage increases. Okay. Outage decreases further with decrease in rho f as expected. So as you keep on decreasing rho f, your outage will increase and your, your outage will decrease and your coverage will increase. Also with increase in epsilon, epsilon is basically, when you increase epsilon, the power for UE1 will increase, right? So when the power for UE1 incre increases, the outage experience for UE1 will decrease because you're giving it more power, so the outage will decrease. Similarly, with increase in parameter of beta, beta is basically, you know, the parameter which captures a decoding error. If the decoding error is more, then your outage will increase. So with increase in parameter of beta, your outage increases. Next slide, slide number 85. So uh, again, the x-axis uh, threshold, y-axis outage probability. Outage of UE1 and UE2 is plotted, okay? And next slide, slide number 86. The x-axis is uh, epsilon, which is a fraction of power. Outage, uh, y-axis is rate, okay? Slide number 87, next slide. So, we are going to say some inferences about the previous rate graph, okay? So C1 is a total rate of UE1 in both FD and HD cell, okay? That is the definition of C1. Observe that C1 increases with increase in epsilon, okay? Which means with increase in power for UE1, C1 will increase. That's what we expect, right? So if you give it more power, the rate will increase. Whereas C2 will decrease with increase in epsilon. That means we decrease, uh, you know, as you decrease the power for UE2, C2 will decrease. The rate for UE2 will decrease. But the total achievable rate, that means C1 plus C2, increases with increase in epsilon. Now, what is the reason for this? The UE1 has a better channel condition than UE2. Okay, so if you pump in more power there, the total achievable rate is going to increase. So this is something very similar to the water filling algorithm, which you might have studied, right, by Andrea Guzman. So if you want the system capacity or system rate to increase, you have to pump in more power to the good channel. You can even ignore some very bad channels. But if you pump in more power to the good channel, then your system power will increase. It might not be a very fast thing, but if your goal is only to increase the system capacity, then you have to pump in more power for the good channel. That's what happens here also. Okay. With increase in rho f, there's an increase in achievable rate. I mean, this is expected. When the fraction of full duplex base station increases, the outage will increase, but your rate also will increase. Okay. So this is basically a trade-off which the system designers have to choose. How much rate you want or how much outage you want and all that. Also observe that at low beta, when the decoding error is low in UE1, the impact of change in rho f is more profound. So the value of rho f, what value it is, that is the impact of change in that, is more profound than at high beta. See, because at high beta, already you're doing a significant amount of decoding error. So it doesn't really matter what your rho f value is going to be. Next topic is going to be impulsive interference, okay? So it's the last topic of this uh, session. Okay. Slide number 19. What is impulsive interference? Okay, so generally, you know, we have studied about power and rate adaptation, in, uh, Andrea Goldsmith's famous papers and all that. So uh, they assume basically that you are going to have additive by Gaussian noise. You have AWGN noise. But the interference uh, need not be, you know, it need not follow an AWGN uh, model. It can be impulsive. That means, as I told you, an interference prediction problem, 
you need not have interference in all the slots. It can be there for some slot, it cannot be there for some slot and all that. Okay, so the interference can be impulsive. So you need not have interference at all for a long time. Suddenly an interference may pop up and suddenly it may die down and all that. So if you have a system like this, how do you do the adaptation, the rate and adaptation and power adaptation? That is the question we have. Okay. So next slide, some literature survey. So apart from wireless communication, the impulsive interference has been studied in other related areas like power line communication. Okay. And one of the models, popular models to model this impulsive interference is a Bernoulli Gaussian model. It was given reference to. People also use a frequency domain approach uh, to model impulsive interference. So what is the model? So TC is a coherence time. Okay. TS is a symbol time. Let me assume that in a coherence time, there can be four symbols. Okay. Now this, this pink is basically your impulsive noise. So it occurs in the first symbol, and then for next two symbols, it doesn't occur. Then it occurs in the fourth symbol. For next two symbols, it doesn't occur. It occurs in the seventh symbol, so on and so forth. Okay, it can keep on occurring randomly. Okay. So the probability with which interference occurs in the symbol is P. The probability with which it doesn't occur is one minus. Okay, so this is where Bernoulli comes in. The interference process model is called the Bernoulli Gaussian model. Gaussian comes in the fact that the power it takes, okay, that is Gaussian distributed, like your in your AWGN, right? The noise power is basically Gaussian distributed. So here also the power it takes is Gaussian distributed. Okay. So next slide, slide number 93. To put it mathematically, your system model is going to be like this. Ym equals hm xm plus wm plus im for all m greater than zero. Okay, so hx plus w plus i, where w is your AWGN noise of variance sigma n squared. Okay, your h is really distributed. Your i is the interference power, okay, or interference process. Okay, so it's im is equal to bm into gm, where bm is the Bernoulli process and gm is the Gaussian random variable of variance sigma is good. So I told you that the interference is Bernoulli Gaussian model, right? So IM can be written as BM into GM, but BM is a Bernoulli process and GM is a Gaussian random variable of variance sigma is good. So the probability that BM equal to zero is one minus P, the probability that BM equal to one is P, okay? Now, uh, when there's no impulsive interference, your SNR is going to be mod H squared P by sigma N squared. When there is impulsive interference, your SNR is going to be mod h squared p by sigma n squared plus sigma e squared, okay? And this will, this mod h squared p by sigma n squared will occur for one minus p times. Mod h squared p by sigma e squared will occur for p times, okay? Nu is the ratio of sigma e squared by sigma n squared, okay? Next slide, slide number 95. So if you do a conventional water filling, like what is done in the Andrea Goldsmith's work, okay? This will be your spectral efficiency. And you have to find this parameter eta numerically. So you want to satisfy a certain probability of error. For certain probability of error, you want to maximize your spectral efficiency, okay? This parameter eta has to be found numerically as given here in the second equation, okay? Slide number 96. We propose two different approaches than what is then uh, Andrea's work. The first approach we propose is you neglect the impulsive interference completely and do water filling, assuming only AWGN. So you just assume that there's no impulsive interference at all and do water filling, assuming only AWGN, okay? If you do that, this is the rate that you will get and you have to find this parameter alpha and numerically, okay? The next thing we propose is called as conservative water filling. You assume that the impulsive interference always exists, okay? And do your water filling, okay? And this is the rate that you will get. And you have to find this parameter alpha i using this equation, okay? Now, we are coming to the plots. We are basically going to see how our aggressive water filling and conservative water filling performs when compared to the conventional water filling of Andrea Goldsmith, okay? So the x-axis is p, the probability of the, I told you, you know, the Bernoulli probability with which the impulsive interference will occur. The y-axis is the average spectral efficiency, okay? So the blue curve is a conventional water filling, the Andrea Goldsmith one. The red curve is aggressive water filling and the black line is a conservative water filling, okay? 
at very low values of p okay you see that my aggressive water filling performs better than conventional water filling so my red curve is higher than the blue curve at higher values of p you will see that my black line my conservative water filling performs better than my conventional water filling my black line is better than the blue line okay so always you will find that either of these two schemes either aggressive water filling or conservative water filling will be better than conventional water filling okay so this is done for u equal to 0 d where sigma i squared equals sigma n squared Let's assume mu equals 20 dB. Uh, you know, sigma i squared is like 100 times of sigma n squared, where your interference power is 100 times of the AWGN power. Here also the same thing holds. Okay. Always, either of these two schemes will be better than conventional water flame. But the only difference between these two plots is if you go to the previous slide 98, okay, the probability at which this transition happens, okay. So here, you can say till p is equal to 0.5. Okay, my aggressive water filling is better than conventional water filling. Here, till p is equal to 0.95, okay, you say that aggressive water filling is better than conventional water filling. And only for p equal to 0.95 to p equal to 1, my conservative water filling is better than conventional water filling. Okay. So the value of p at which this transition happens depends on the value of mu. Okay, depends on, you know, how powerful is your interference power when compared to the AWGN power? So this we have not yet been able to derive analytically to find the transition of you know, what value of P it happens. It's still an open problem. People who are interested can try this. Okay. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude my um, session. So what we have seen is basically we have seen about finding coverage for a Poisson point process deriving error vector magnitude for different kinds of things for external network model, Poisson point process model, correlated intervals, multiple antenna systems, and then we saw DPD communication, and then we saw interference prediction. The final, uh, finally, uh, the two problems which we saw were full duplex, half duplex uh, thing, and the latest one is the impulsive interference, power and rate adaptation. So it's very diverse kind of problems that we have seen. So what or the future areas uh, where you can apply stochastic geometry. So stochastic geometry can be used for analysis of UAV networks. Right? So we have all these UAV base stations in 5G and 6G. So you can, you know, you can assume that the locations of the base stations are random. So that is something which uh, stochastic geometry can be applied. It can be used for analysis of vehicular networks. And because you do not know the distribution of the vehicles. Lastly, it can also be used to analyze terahertz wave networks because uh, millimeter wave networks in 5G Stochastic geometry techniques have been used a lot, you know, for analyzing, analyzing the blockage and all that. Similar thing can be done for terahertz also. Okay. So with this slide, I am concluding my talk. And uh, thanks for attending my talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sudarshan. So you have covered a lot of things and you have given many directions too. It was quite interesting. So definitely those who are working in this area will with the, the benefit and they will come to know and they can explore more on these directions. Okay, I open to the participants. If you have any questions, you can, and you can interact with the speaker. Ah, yes, Ranjan, please go ahead. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, sir, you have touched up a lot of uh, things means regarding uh, coverage probability. So my first question is, uh, uh, is the coverage probability and outage probability are correlated or they are some different? Term? Oh, yeah. Outage is just one minus coverage. Yeah. So coverage is probably that SAR is greater than threshold. Outage is probably that SAR is less than threshold. Yeah. And uh, in Nakagami outage probability graph also, you have mentioned that there was uh, L interference. So these L interference can be interpreted as the L multipath uh, links. Um, OK, so yeah, so right now I have assumed only flat fading for all these things. I didn't take ISA into account. 
I think if you assume ISA also, you'll get the same kind of result only. You can assume these L things as different interference, or if you take a frequency selective fading channel and assume there is inter-symbol interference, I think that also you'll get the same result only. Yeah. And uh, the Markovian distribution you have opt uh, it's in some slide. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, the Markovian is very old uh, way to as allocate some uh, probability distribution. So, what is some update or updated? Because uh, Markovian is a very static, uh, and that required some uh, uh, thing which is adaptive in nature. Because uh, the 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 uh, dynamicity of uh, the co channel coefficient is uh, weighing, you know, uh, you know, very dynamic. So, uh, what is the utility of this Markovian distribution uh, in present and uh, future scenario? Okay, so uh, we assume the Markovian only for a very specific case. Where, uh, so, I am saying that the interferers are not always active. They will be active in this time slot. They might be inactive in the next time slot and so on and so forth. So, to model this transition, I am using this Markovian process because that is generally used to model, you know, probability of one given one, that means being active in the next time slot, given that you're active in the present time slot. So generally the Markovian, uh, Markov Markovian property is used. So only for that specific case, we have used Markovian here. And uh, I, I think that also you can make those parameters dependent on channel and you can do all those fancy things. Yeah, that's also possible. Here we have just assumed that beta and X0 and X1 to be constant, but they can also be channel dependent. That will also be interesting, yeah. One more last question is regarding the Kappa mu channel, which you have suggested and shows the, yeah. some very interesting results about that regarding the outage probability CDF plots and all. So uh, my question is uh, that uh, uh, the field data of which we have, uh, you know, get it uh, through some drive test and all. So wh what is the optimal value of these parameters you have experienced that? Uh, yes, with this value, we can say that this is the exact uh, exactly model uh, the fading environment of the present scenario is there uh, any coefficient value you have tested or it's just an extension of uh, that yes uh, we have relay then we have nakagami then we have kappa mu so kappa mu can be uh, down uh, 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 means in encompasses all the lower uh, uh, pdfs and all or is there any uh, uh, testing or evidence he'll prove we are having that for this specific values of k mu and all uh, yes uh, the present scenario can perfectly uh, channelize with, with those coefficient, coefficient so uh, the one application where the kappa mu shadow trading occurs in real life is the device to device communication uh, where the, i refer the paper by professor cotton sl cotton so in that paper, they have given what are the typical values of mu, kappa, and m that they observe on field. I don't remember that top of my head, but in that can paper, you can, can find you, the... Can you, share, uh, can you share me the... Uh, can, you, can you share with uh, that paper to us with? Yeah, I can share the slide with uh, Dr. Neelagan and he can uh, share with all of you. So in that, the reference okay. is given. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so that's on there is a question in the text box. Uh, what is the impact yeah. of 5G signal transmission in the presence of high air pressure or low air pressure? Sorry, I didn't get you. Sorry. In the text box, can you see the question? Uh, oh, in the text box. Huh? In chat, chat huh? In chat or? Yeah, in the chat box. Okay, for some reason I am not able to see it. No problem. It says the chat is available only to team members. Maybe I am not okay. I'm not able okay. to see the chat. So okay. That is, can you please tell me the impact of signal 5G signal transmission in the presence of high air pressure or low air pressure? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm actually not aware of this. Can you say me like that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Even the relate. I mean, why the pressure comes into this transmission? No, it's, 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 maybe it happens in millimeter wave because. The atmospheric effects plays a role in the millimeter wave, right? In 20 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz. But I'm not sure what role pressure plays. I have to go and check. I am also yeah. not asked. We talk about the uh, atmospheric nature and the channels, but not about the pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Sudarshan. Thank you very much for your time. So uh, definitely you. uh, collaborate again uh, uh, some other occasion. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, just Sudarshan, just a minute. Yeah. yeah. Ilyasi, you would like to ask something? Uh, yes, sir. Sir, good morning, sir. Yeah, good morning. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, this is Hedar C from uh, Anna University. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have one uh, question. Uh, the uh, conventional scheme, uh, fractional frequency reuse, software frequency reuse, uh, we have implemented in uh, regular hexagonal cell geometry. Uh, is it possible to implement in uh, stochastic geometry? Because we have developed also one uh, frequency partitioning scheme. Uh, that's why. My question regarding the stochastic, is it possible to implement uh, using stoch stochastic geometry? Yes, I think so. So I can I can check the papers by Dr. Suman Kumar, who is now currently in IIT Roper. Okay. So if you go to his Google Scholar page, I think he has done some amount of work in this field of using FFR, SFR. Uh, hmm. If I remember correct, maybe I think you can check his Google Scholar page. Dr. Suman Kumar, IIT Roper. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Sudarshan. So, thank you very much. So, we will get in touch with you later. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, participants, uh, the next speaker will join at 11 30. So, until then, we can take a break. So, the, the meeting will be alive. Just you come and uh, be active at 11 30. If you wish, you can leave and rejoin again. That's up to you, but this meeting uh, room will be uh, active. 